My message today is entitled, What Are You Looking At? You guys ever heard like, has anybody ever looked at you and said, what are you looking at? Right? What are you looking at? What does that mean? What does that, what does that connote? What does that make you think of? I was a middle school and high school teacher, and then I was a high school principal uh, for 20 years. And let me tell you, a lot of my day got consumed with those words. Something happened that started with, what are you looking at? You say, what do you mean? It's like, you know, when something's getting ready to escalate, something's getting ready to happen, those are words that are frequently, frequently said. I was driving down the road, and uh, I was driving. I have a pickup truck, so I sit kind of high. And I was driving down the road, and I stopped at a light, and I looked over, and the guy next to me had the world's, this is like not too long ago, but the world's best mullet I have ever seen. I'm talking, you know, business in the front, party in the back. He's got a rat tail. I mean, he is, and I'm like, I saw it. Can you look back? <laughs> I'm like, I want to look again. I want to see it. But I'm afraid he's going to say, what are you looking at? Right? Right? Because then I'm going to have to back it up. I'm, well, what am I going to say if he says that? So our message for today, church, what are you looking at? What are you looking at? Let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning and we're so thankful for the opportunity to gather. We're thankful for the opportunity to come together, Lord, to hear your word, to sing about your word, to celebrate with one another the forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ. I ask that you be with our time together. Help me to clearly present your word, Lord. Everything I say, everything I do, Lord, I ask that you would use it. Those that need to hear it could hear it. They could feel it in a way to bring about change, Lord, to bring about change in our lives. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So turn with me, if you could, to Numbers 21, 1 through 9. I, I, sorry, I do have to put the glasses on. For those of you that know, I'm like in that in-between stage. If I'm going to read this, I'm going to have to put them on. But if I leave them on and look out at you, I'm going to get sick. So I'm going to be pulling them back, back and forth. So Numbers 21, verses 1 through 3, we're going to start with. When the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who lived in the Negeb, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Athrim, he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. And Israel vowed a vow to the Lord and said, if you will indeed give the people into my hand, then I will devote their, excuse me, I will devote their cities to destruction. And the Lord heeded the voice of Israel and gave over the Canaanites. And they devoted them and their cities to destruction. So the name of the place was called Horma, and Horma means devoted to destruction. So what's going on here? We can see in this story, some of us may not realize this, but the Israelites have been wandering. I know if Pastor Josh preached last week, they've been wandering in the wilderness. It's getting to the end of that 40-year time, and this is a new group of Israelites. This is the next generation of Israelites, and when they come up on this adversary, they come up on this difficulty, they come up on this trouble, they devote themselves to the Lord. They make a vow before the Lord that they're going to take care of business. The, uh, in the chapter before, Aaron had passed away, Moses' brother. Miriam had passed away. Moses has a great sin in his life where he, Pastor Josh taught, where, where he's supposed to speak to the rock and he strikes the rock twice. And so now there's this consequence for Moses. There's the consequence for the older generation that have been traveling around in the wilderness for some 40 years. It actually sounds like a pretty good reflection to me. Like the new generation, they're, they're taking care of business, but they've also grown up or lived in a time, the lowest number that any biblical scholar thinks of the number of Israelites that had to die was 600,000. So for 40 years, 600,000 people had to die. That's 41 people per day if they all had to die equally. That's a lot of people. They've grown up in this situation. They've grown up understanding that God had said this is the consequence. 
And their, their clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't wear out. They're receiving this food from heaven every day. They're seeing a lot of what God has prepared for them. And unlike their fathers who went and tried to fight without the Lord's blessing and went and tried to fight without the Lord's power, this group, they got together and they made this vow and they took care of business. But why, why did the king strike them? I tried to tell somebody, you know, three million people, two million people, whatever it is, they come walking through your town. You can imagine what you would be thinking if you were on the other side of that situation. They're coming around and, and there's so many of them and, and there's these miraculous things that even the Canaanites could see are happening in their lives. Let's pick up in verse four. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. And we loathe this worthless food. Uh-oh, this is the same old story. It's the same old story in the Israelites' history. It's the same old story where they become dissatisfied with what's happening. They become dissatisfied with what's going on. They take their eyes off of the prize or the goal or what they're supposed to be doing, and they start to look at this other thing. and like, you know, this food is worthless. Instead of being excited that God had provided that food every day. You brought us out here in the wilderness we're, you know, this is terrible. And how often do we as Christians, do we as believers, let our circumstances dictate how we feel about our, our circumstance, our, our, our relationship? And I try to remind people, it's not about how you feel. For those of you that are married, some days, if you're being honest with yourself, you don't feel like being a good spouse. I have three children. <laughs> three I was pretty good with one. My wife and I, we were okay, right? It was, it was even, two on two. And since the third child, I have just been chasing life, okay? I was, have been no good, and nothing better could teach you the need for Jesus Christ in your life than being overwhelmed by your children, right? You have so much going on, and you have to chase after their schedules, their wants, their needs. So here you have this situation where all of these things are coming together. And they just had this wonderful experience where they won the battle and they vowed. And then immediately, because their circumstances changed, they're complaining. And not only are they complaining like their moms and dads complained, they're putting a little extra on it, right? You know, there's no food. Well, that's a lie. Okay, so number one, they're lying. Number two, then they admit there's food in their, in their complaining, and it's worthless, good for nothing, detestable, some translations in Bible commentaries will tell us. So here you go. They've just had that victory, and now, boom. One of the commentators said, each step they made south and east rather than north and west seemed to be unbearable backtracking. They had been so very near the land and had even tasted the sweet wine of victory and now they're wandering again. And in their wanderings, they seem to be as far from real food as ever. Now, I don't know if you guys struggle with this, but I struggle with backtracking. Are any of you like that? You struggle with backtracking? I, if I had to backtrack even a mile from a detour, I start to get upset. My wife and I, she decided she's going to surprise me. We were on our way to South Carolina. I'm a big history buff. She goes, you've never been to the Statue of Liberty. I'm like, no. no I've never been to the Statue of Liberty. She's like, on our way, we're going to stop, and we're going to spend some time at the Statue of Liberty. But I've heard it's better to go on the New Jersey side. I'm like, okay. So we plotted everything. Well, I did not realize when I got to New Jersey, they have two expressways right next to each other going the same way with the same number, with the same markings, but you're just supposed to know <laughs> that this expressway, there's no way off this expressway for every 20 to 25 miles. 
This expressway is the expressway that you need to be on if you want to get to the exit where you would get on the ferry to go to the Statue of Liberty. So I'm buzzing, like, hey, the exit's coming up. I can see the exit. There is a concrete divider between me. There's like none of those emergency turnarounds. I mean, there's, there's nothing. I'm going to have to plow. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to backtrack. Then the next sign says, next exit, 27 miles. I'm going to have to backtrack 27 miles. So I go as fast as I can to get to those 27 miles, turn around. I'm already complaining by the time I hit the Vida, right? I'm complaining to come. I got to go 27 stinking miles. Who grew up here? Who designed these roads? What's wrong with these people, right? I'm just going and going and going. Head back. I'm buzzing because now I realize the last ferry leaves at 4 o'clock. It's 346. I got 27 miles to get there and then buy my ticket and then get on the boat, right? I'm thinking, I've got pictures that I'm going to be swimming for the boat. And I'm just going as fast as I can. And I get there and we got there just in time to wave goodbye to the boat. Bye. Bye. Took a picture from land with the Statue of Liberty over my shoulder got back in the car, and not only did I have to backtrack, but now I have to drive to South Carolina, okay? Like, there's nothing for me today, right? And I'm complaining, and I'm irritated, and I'm angry, and man, that is a weak moment for latching out. That is a weak moment when you say, man, God, don't you love me? Don't you care? And I know people here are like, who cares? What is wrong with you? It was important to me right? It's just like when we look at our neighbor and say, who cares? But it's important to them. It was important to me. The plan had been changed, right? So the Israelites, they have this big victory and they can almost see it, right? They can see it. We're the new generation. We have the victory. We vowed ourselves to God and Moses is taking us the wrong direction. And it says that the terrain, that direction was extremely difficult. And it was a difficult walk. And you're wondering, we just worked hard together. We just saw the victory. We've dedicated ourselves to the Lord. We have his blessing. We have his power. Except that Moses was doing what God had told him to do. God had told him not to go through the land of Edom unless they gave their permission. And they said no. So now they had to walk. But again, the Israelites, they took it further, right? You, you start to say things and you start to think things. Psalms 78 verse 25. Psalm 78, 25 says about the manna. It says, man ate of the bread of the angels. He sent them food in abundance. So not only were there complaining lies, but now they're, they're almost you know, smacking the hand of the person who's giving them a gift, right? How many of you continue to give gifts to people that smack your hand? Or the old saying, and I know we wouldn't do it in today's world, the old saying was, they spit in your face. How many people are going to continue to be giving gifts, right, when people that are, you're giving the gift to spit in your face and react that way? The venom of their attack on God was immense, They start out letting their emotions get to them and take them over, and you begin to say terrible things. As I mentioned before, I'm pretty good with other people's kids. I'm really good. But my own biological units, they know exactly where that microscopic button is that nobody else can see, and they just know how to walk up and go, (laughs) <laughs> Boop. and normally for me especially when they were little it revolved around food I had worked hard to prepare the food I had worked hard to provide the food and I had worked hard to get them cleaned up and get them to the table and get them all latched into all these chairs right and all these I had three kids under the age of five right you gotta lock them down okay you gotta get ready for business this is war it's dinner time 
And my wife and I were reading a book, and I believe in the book, and it said, you know, you need to give kids choices. And the first time that they said this food that I made, that I made for them, it wasn't healthy. I'm not one of those people. I know some of you think, oh, he might have fed them. No. I fed them what normal kids in America like. It's junk, right? I fed them chicken nuggets and mac and cheese. And, and you know, the most healthy thing was a processed fruit full of sugar on it, right? I'm just doing I, everything. This is sick. This is disgusting. <laughs> right? And my blood pressure starts. And I'm like, I'm going to give you two choices. You can eat it with teeth or you can eat it without teeth. <laughs> this, is, this is what's going to happen. This food is going in your mouth. I don't care if you like it. I will force feed it. Okay, I will hold your nose until you swallow. Okay, I mean, this is, I'm in, and you start thinking, I'm like, how did I allow? It was the first word of the complaining. It just wells up when I deal with families that are hurting and families that are in struggles with anger. And, and I said, listen, you have to, you can't start with the first word. You might even be right. I actually think most of the time, until I threatened to knock their teeth out, I was right. I was in the right. It was time to eat. I had paid for the food. I had prepared for the food. Like everything was right. I was in the right. But I let their reaction well me up. And then the complaining about they ungrateful. You know, I give them the whole thing. You know, there's people in other parts of the world that can't eat, right? You know, I'm doing all those things that you say you'll never do. I did them all. Sounded just like my parents, right? You know, in that moment of weakness, ah, freaking out, right? You know, because I'm allowing my emotions and I'm allowing my circumstance to dictate how I feel and what's right in my life. The Israelites are doing the same thing here. The fact that God is telling them they have to walk the wrong direction to get to the promised land, they don't like it. And then they say, oh, you know, there's no food and water. A little bit of a complaint, a little bit of a lie. Oh, now it's worthless food. Even what he's giving us is terrible. This is disgusting, right? And they continue to pile on and pile on. Let's read from John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 32 through 35. That's where we'll begin. John 6, 32 through 35. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Let's pick up in verse 48. It says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the, for the life of the world is my flesh. Verse 58, this is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. This rejection in numbers of the manna is spoken about in the Gospel of John. This rejection of manna is tantamount to rejecting the grace of God in salvation. They're rejecting it. It's worthless. Instead of doing what they know to do, instead of looking and keeping their focus and keeping their eyes on what they're supposed to be doing, they allow their emotions and their circumstances to change. What are you looking at? They were looking at their own success. They just came off a big battle and they kicked butt. I mean, they went after it. They thought they had the power in their own spirit, in their own numbers, in their own successes, right? This is what, look what we can do. Church, I fall into this trap all the time. It was my prayer this morning that I preach this sermon in the power of the Holy Spirit because what I have to say means nothing. I want to make sure it's what God has for us this morning. 
I fall into this trap. Are we doing the same thing that they're doing? Are we, are we rejecting the word of God? Are we rejecting? And some people say, no. Okay. Well, I meet with a lot of people and talk through a lot of issues. And I hear this. I can't follow God's plan for marriage, Pastor. I can't follow God's plan for marriage because that will interrupt the benefits that I get. I can't follow God's plan. We're just going to continue to live together. You know, God really didn't mean it what he was talking about marriage. I can't follow God's plan, Pastor, for my finances. I don't have anything. I can't be generous with people. I can't be generous with the church. I can't give. I don't have anything to give. I think he says to be generous and give. I think he says the plan is for marriage. I can't follow God's plan on how my time is spent, Pastor. I'm busy. I can't serve others. Well, what are we here for? What are we here for if it's not to serve and love others? Are we here to make a living? Or are we here to make a difference? And yes, you have to make a living. I understand that. Of course you have to make a living. But it can't trump being generous. Can't trump spending your time in service to others and loving others. I can't follow God's plan for my family. I have to be in control. I think the scriptures teaches a dependence on God. Not I am in control, but he is in control. And what he wants. What are you looking at? What am I looking at? What are you looking at? What are we looking at? Do we have our focus in the wrong place? I can't follow God's plan for the culture. I have to accept everybody as good. Wow. Wow. That's a tough one in today's world. Everybody's good. My Bible tells me that my heart is desperately wicked. I want what I want. I can't follow God's plan for loving my neighbor. They don't agree with me in the election. How can I love somebody who supports the other side? I can't support them. They kneel for the flag. I don't know that he put that caveat in our scriptures. I don't know that there's an asterisk there that says, love those who agree with you. I'm being real because I don't like it when they kneel for the flag. I don't like it at all. But I don't think my scriptures and my obedience to God gives me a way out. I am commanded to love them. And to care for them. And to try to do what's right for them. But we allow our head knowledge. We allow what the world has told us of how things should be. The last one, I can't follow except that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. I think everybody's going to get there. It's sad, but that's what a lot of people I talk to believe. I think we're all going to get there. I don't. Narrow is the way. There's one way to heaven through Jesus Christ. Church, what are we looking at? Are we looking at the world? Are we looking at culture? Or are we looking at his word and looking to Jesus Christ? Let's pick back up in Numbers chapter 21, starting in verse 6. We'll see what God chose to do about this offense. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, 
he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Once more, God is rejected by his people. This pattern of rebellion and then judgment is documented throughout the Old Testament. The consequences for their actions is God sends snakes. It says fiery snakes. As I studied it, it doesn't mean the snakes are on fire. It means that once they bite you, you're on fire. And it's painful, and it's agonizing, and it's slow. And it leads to death. Very much like every one of our condition on this world. We are all bit by sin. And it leads to pain, and it leads to agony, and it burns, and it takes a while. And it leads to death. What are we to do? And then it says, it's such a strange scripture here, where they weren't supposed to make graven images, but God tells Moses to make a graven image. And then he tells him to put it on a pole. And he says, put it in a pole so that everyone can see. Usually, when you read the stories of these plagues, you read the scriptures and talk about the plague, a plague turns on and a plague turns off, right? That's what we see. Something happened, the Israelites say, oh, no, we're sorry. And then Moses goes and intercedes and turns off. Not this time. Not this time. It didn't turn off. Even those who believed could get bit. They're walking together, and many of them, who after they said they were sorry, were bit after they said they were sorry. Our world tells us that when you make a decision and it's the wrong decision, that you really don't have to live with the consequences of that decision. The Israelites here had to live with the consequences of their corporate decision. You're still going to get bit, it's still going to hurt. You're still going to feel like you're going to die. But you can look to the serpent on the stick and be saved and be healed and not die. And we get a wonderful picture here, a wonderful picture of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. One of the commentators I love, it says, this is a pattern of complaining. It's a habit-forming uh, pattern. The tendency among people to go beyond where one left off the last time no way. You will become even more egregious, even more outspoken. Rarely does complaining become milder with their complaints. Finally, complaining becomes self-destructive. Church, are we complainers? I mean, we have so much. Are we complainers? I think about it. I am. I laugh sometimes and look at my, you know, tell my wife, I go, first world problems, but I'm complaining. It's in our human nature. Instead of stopping and saying, what have you done for me? God, thank you so much for what you've done for me. About six years ago, I started feeling really bad, not feeling well. So I'm not afraid of the doctor, so I went to the doctor. The doctor looked at me and said, you're doing fine. You need to lose a little weight. You need to be a little bit more active. Okay. So I start riding bike. I start doing these things, eating a little better, going out on 18-mile bike rides, all the way from Rochester to Lake Orion and back, having a great time, loving it. Then one day I get out on a bike ride, and I lost the feeling below my waist while I'm riding a bike with my kids on a trail. And so I slowly creep and then fall off the bike, didn't get hurt, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, man, something is really wrong. Go back to the doctor. Doctor says, you're fine. I said, I'm not fine. So we fire that doctor, we get another doctor. Sitting in there, he comes in, he's reading the thing. My wife is a nurse, and she's not in the room yet. He's reading the report. He goes, I think that doctor ran every test you're supposed to run. I said, listen, doc. You can call the cops if you don't figure something out. Because when she gets in the room and you say the other doctor was right, this is going to be a bad, bad day for you. She, she means it. She's ready to rush. She's ready to fight. 
And he goes, well, there's only one test that they haven't ran. And I said, great, let's run the test. He goes, it's $7,000. And if it doesn't diagnose anything, you'll have to pay the $7,000. And I said, hey, what's money if you're dead? Let's do it. And so I did it. And the very next week, the doctor calls me and he goes, yay, um, you need to not lift up your kids anymore. You need to not lift up a gallon of milk. Lifting up a gallon of milk could kill you. The weight of a gallon of milk is too much pressure on your aorta. Your aorta is getting ready to explode. For those of you that don't know, that's the main valve and segue for blood to come out of your heart. I'm like, okay, well, let's, let's get down to business. Let's, let's do this. What do I got to do? Well, we got to do this surgery, but I, I only do three of these surgeries a day, and um, you're actually pretty healthy. So I do people in order of death. So if I do you first, somebody else will die, so I'm doing them first. And I said, okay, so I'm that good. I can wait to the end of the school year. This was October. I said, I can wait to the end of the school year and do it in the summer. He goes, you'll be dead by graduation. I'm like, okay, let's go back. I want to do it now. Let's go back. I want to do it now, right? And God gave my family a sweet, sweet time. We got to have Thanksgiving break. We got to have Christmas break together. But it was hard. He said, you know, write your will, talk to the people that need to get your kids if something happens to your wife, you know, write your kids a note, buy them a present, the whole thing. I'm like, Whew. and I remember letting my circumstances at some times in those moments, and I'm going to confess to you, there were moments that I said, God, what is going on? I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to be a good dad. I'm trying to be a good husband. I'm trying to follow you. Why do I have to go through this? And everybody would quote that verse to me. You know, All things work together for good. That doesn't feel very good, let me tell you. Your death works together for good, and I know that's true at some level, but that doesn't feel that great when you got a 10-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 5-year-old. Okay? But in that moment, I allowed that to come over me and then met with people and prayed with people. And by the end of it, I want to tell you, I had a sweet time. I was so ready. I did everything they told me to do. I was so ready. I, I was giddy going in for this surgery. I was ready. I was ready to feel good or I was ready to be gone. And God gave, gave my family this blessing. So we really enjoy God's blessing in our life. But we would have been blessed the other way too, guys. You have to be willing to say that. You have to be willing to think that. You have to be willing to message that to yourself. And that's what we're talking here. What are you looking at? I can stop my life and look at God allowed this to happen to me, and I can burn my life down. Or I can say, God, what am I supposed to learn through this situation? What am I supposed to do through this situation? Who am I supposed to love, and how can I love you better in this situation Allowing that complaining tests God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 9, it says, We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. Listen, God didn't tell Moses, have them make ointment, have them make boots, have them make an offering, have them take out their swords and kill the snakes. He didn't say any of that. He said, when they're bit, look to the serpent. Just like you and I are bit, and we need to look to Christ. John 3, verses 14 and 15 says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Hebrews 9, 27, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment. If we look by faith to Christ, he will save us and he will give us eternal life. What are you looking at? Are we looking to Christ? Are you looking to Christ? I ask myself that, what am I looking at? Why? Why am I wanting to look at the wrong things? Why am I wanting to look the wrong way? Why am I wanting to look at my circumstances? Romans 10, 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
Moses didn't take the serpent and hide the serpent. He didn't. He put it up and lifted it up so that people could see. Jesus Christ was crucified in a public manner so that all could see, so that history could record that Jesus Christ died and he is the Savior of mankind. Wearsby, one of the great commentators I love, Moses didn't stick the pole inside the tabernacle or even inside the tabernacle court because nobody is saved by keeping the law. The uplifted serpent was only the cure in the camp, just as Jesus Christ is the only Savior of sinners in the world. Nobody could look at the bronze serpent for another person. Each dying sinner has to look for himself or herself. Salvation through Christ offered is personal. It's individual. And each of us must look to Christ by faith, no matter how hard they tried. No dying Jew could save himself or herself. The only salvation available was that God had graciously provided. And if you reject it, you die. There's nothing that you and I can do to attain salvation. It is there He has been high and lifted up, and it is there for us through faith to see. But we can reject it. And those that reject it die. And in our circumstance, those of us who reject Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world will live in eternal damnation, everlasting damnation. That should motivate us, church, It should motivate us that if we reject Jesus Christ and die, it's hell. It's ironic to me that sin and death came into the world through a look. Adam and Eve looked at the fruit. They looked. And salvation and redemption can come from you and for for us by looking to Jesus Christ our Lord. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22 says, Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, there is no other. I don't know how to make it any more clear, church. For those of you this morning that are believers and followers of Jesus Christ, we need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus and his word and use his word to direct our lives. That's my challenge today. To not do what the Israelites did. To not be complainers. It didn't happen our way. We're not in control. To not care for the things of this world and the wisdom of this world more important than the wisdom of God's word. And for those of you who are unbelievers, today or now is the day of salvation. Right where you are, you can accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. For all have sinned to come short of the God, court, excuse me, short of the glory of God, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I don't want anybody in this world to lie to you. I'm trying to say it as straightly as I can say it. Jesus Christ, we have to look through faith to Jesus Christ to be saved. It's not what your parents believe. It's not what your family does. It's not the good things that you and I do that lead us to Jesus Christ. It is nothing. Those things are filthy rags, the scripture says. It is accepting and believing that Jesus Christ is Lord. You can do that today. There are staff members here. If you're not comfortable doing it at your seat, you can come forward when the band plays in a moment and ask to speak with somebody. We would be happy to show you in God's word. For those of you that are believers, followers, many of you have not submitted to baptism. I can't tell you. God's word tells us that this is an important aspect of our walk with Jesus Christ. Come forward and be baptized. The scripture says frequently, saved and baptized. For those of you that are living in circumstances and you're looking at the world's wisdom instead of looking at your wisdom, let's look at his wisdom. His wisdom for your life. 
There's so much wisdom in this book. Daily looking at this book to help us focus our lives. What are you looking at, church? What are we looking at, church? Ask yourself, what am I looking at? Will you please stand and let's pray. Lord, I come before you. We ask forgiveness, Lord, for where we failed you. Lord, I pray that you be with this body. Those that needed to hear will be challenged to change, Lord. Those that need to be baptized will come forward. Those who don't know you, Lord, please give someone in this room the ability to tell them, to show them, to lead them to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the acceptance and belief that he is the sacrifice for mankind and through him we will have eternal life. I ask all this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.